Um, so, as Hilton said, uh, amongst the, the many hats that I've worn over the years, one of them was indeed an analyst at Gartner, which is good and bad for you guys. Uh, it's good because it, I guess it means that I've got some educated opinions on the subject. It's bad because the Gartner analysts have definitely got an opinion. It doesn't make us right or wrong, except when we're still employed by Gartner, and of course we're right. But in the context of today, it doesn't make it right or wrong, it just is. Um, but the great thing about doing um, this talk today um, is working with Hilton and Andre and the team. Is, it, it's really refreshing. That says, no, no, no. Give them something that's interesting and fresh. It doesn't have to play into the tool. So share some insights that might help people to move from where they are. And I think that some of the best ways that we can look to the future is when we look to the past. So, hey, um, this is pretty unusual, actually, because... The, the guys would say that if we were in Bonn and possibly in the um, Berlin EA Connect days, then actually there'd be a whole bunch of people that said I was still at school or in diapers in 1999. <laughs> so here we have a, a, an audience that can go back there. So just have anyone, anyone think of anything from 1999 that might stick in their heads? Y2K. Y2K, yeah. Um, that was certainly a big thing for us um, and actually touches very nicely to where I'm going next. But of course, you know, the hit films were things like The Matrix with the, the Nokia 8110 phone. Wow. And I was just Googling it just now to remind myself and it said it was amazing because it had a crystal clear monochrome LCD display. <laughs> and you could text using a keyboard. Wow. Incredible. Um, now, not everything has changed because I did look at the top hits just to see who was around. Turns out Britney Spears started her career then. Um, but that wasn't as interesting as seeing that actually top of the billboard charts were sure. So sometimes in 20 years, not much changes. <laughs> okay, maybe a little more plastic. Sorry, Cher. Um, but nonetheless, um, some things do stand the test of time. But, you know, so much was, was different. I mean, you know, Hey, wow, you've got a, an IBM 3279 color screen? Gee, I've still got dumb green screens. Some of you don't even, never even saw that particular color terminal, didn't even know it exists. Maybe here you are in 2019 learning it for the first time. Well, there you go, they were pretty rare. But something else happened, and now I'm gonna turn a little bit serious for a moment, because what many of you may not realize is that from 95 until 2000, I spent a lot of time here in New York. Okay, I, my office was actually just a little bit further down Broadway, a little street called Park Place. Most of you will never have heard of it. It's around the back of City Hall, but you do know the other buildings that were nearby. So before I had my apartment in Battery Park City, which sounds so impressive, right? You know, I've got my house in the UK, the apartment in New York. Well, yeah, life's good. Um, but actually my main place of staying was the Marriott at the World Trade Center. So for me, um, this is only, by the way, about the third time since then that I've actually been back. And it still feels really strange coming back to this city, I have to say. Um, I guess because that was where I spent most of my life. I was very fortunate, unlike many of you perhaps here, that actually no one that I knew had, uh, was affected fatally or any other way, given that most of the people that worked for Popkin Software at that time actually commuted in through the station. So for me, it's, it's a really weird thing to be back. But 1999 was actually when Enterprise Architecture Tools were born. Okay? Sorry? You were a user. You saw the... When System Architect... Now, you know, System Architect 2001... Now, Enterprise Architecture wasn't born then because Zachman was writing back in 1990 about the framework. But this was the first tool that said, actually, how do I bring together, at that time, object modeling, structured systems analysis and design, data modeling, and business process re-engineering, and bring them together in a cohesive whole to address what we effectively called the um, enterprise uh, modeling market. Now, we have a, a gentleman here in the front row that someone mentioned to me were, had written in the past for Information Week. And some of the most coverage that this product got back in 1999 was in Information Week, where they did something like a six or an eight page spread on it. So we had the framework, it was the first tool. Um, although um, 
now, some of you may know Brian Burke as being the Chief of Research uh, for the Enterprise Architecture and PPM groups at Gartner. In those days, um, he was with Meta. And indeed, Rich, uh, I still maintain that um, Brian and his colleague then, Richard, were the analyst gurus in the early days of enterprise architecture. Um, the other lady that some of you probably never met was a lady called Greta James. And she was the first analyst at Gartner to start covering the tools. And I was fortunate to be the first person to brief her. So I don't know whether I skewed her agenda or not, but uh, certainly had a very interesting three hours up in Stanford with her. I couldn't find our Google and archive.org um, a quadrant for around 2000, 2001. So these were the earliest quadrants that I could find. So forgive me, I'm sure there were previous ones. But I just wanted to share them just so we could be a little nostalgic to try and remember the names. I mean, by that time, Popkin had already gone and been sold to Telelogic. Um, True Technologies were there, which meant that we weren't talking about Metis anymore. They'd already been acquired by True. Um, IDS Shear was still independent and had managed to get there despite the fact they were only, at that time, a process-oriented tool. Allen Systems Group, some people, wow, hang on a minute, Enterprise Repositories, Adaptive, small UK-based vendor. And we look and think, gee, so many of those people have either gone or those that are still around. Hmm, okay. And here we can see that if we look similar in 2011. But really what I wanted to drive home here is that a lot hasn't changed. And in particular, those vendors that are still around today, what are they selling? The, um, I, how about the same tools they were selling in 1999? Because that's how it feels to me. Uh, and I remember that um, there was um, an analyst that I used to deal with when I was a customer from my Popkin days, an analyst called Mike Blecker. And he used to do a lot of work on the modeling tools. And he came back to covering them, I don't know, it was 2007, 2008, something like that. And he caused a furore that said, headline, I've been away from this space for seven years. Haven't you guys developed anything? And he really wrote some pretty scathing analysis that said, gee, you're still trading on the old stuff the old way. So, you know, I think the world has changed. But it doesn't seem that most EA tools and indeed analysis of those tools has shifted much. Which is kind of strange, sad, but also explains a lot. So a couple of statistics that I borrow from my previous life. Some of you may have seen them. We've certainly used them at enough conferences over the year. 66% of all architecture initiatives fail. Hmm. So let me just suggest here for a moment that if that's the case and you are not changing the way that you are doing enterprise architecture, thinking about enterprise architecture, delivering it, presenting value, you're already dead. Your value to the organization is going away. So as a rough number, I took around about 500 inquiry calls per year while I was at Gartner for three years. Now, you might think most of those were EAs phoning about tooling. A large proportion were because that was my area of coverage. The next largest proportion were CIOs saying, I'm sick to death of my enterprise architects. All they do is produce diagrams, pictures, artifacts. My god, when are they going to add some value to my business? What do I do to make them shift? That was the other significant group of calls. So I'm not saying whether people have to move or have to do something different. I'm just merely suggesting that, well, hang on a minute, two-thirds fail, only one-third succeeds, and most of the execs that are responsible don't value the work that's been done before and are worried that actually they're going to keep making the same mistake again. Just something to think about. Now, when I looked and did some research, and some of you will have seen me using this, at Gartner events um, when I was presenting, is that 84% of enterprise architects either don't use or use the wrong use case when trying to justify tooling. Well, if we had this tool, we could create these diagrams and those diagrams, and that would be so much better for us. I don't care about you. 
What about me? What's it going to help me do? Well, if you had this, you could sort of maybe could or would it? Yeah. Okay. So what? No budget this year. Or, and some of you may have made these kind of inquiries to me, and this is a, a very normal one. So someone would phone up and say, I've looked at the Magic Quadrant. I've looked at all of the vendors. They're all too expensive for me. I need you to recommend some other tools that we can consider because we've only got a budget of, for argument's sake, 20,000. I said, okay, no problem. So why is your budget 20,000? Because my experience is that it's not a problem getting a million dollars for enterprise architecture tooling. Anyone else ever had a problem getting a million dollars? Because I never have. And you're all now wondering, well, hang on a minute, what's he thinking that I'm not? Okay, you're right, there's a bit of a trick to it. All I've got to do is to show I'm solving a $100 million problem. My CEO is going to have no problem writing the check. The reason their budget's only 20,000 is the manager says, I've got no idea what you really want. I've got no idea what the real value is. I'll tell you what, I'll gamble 20,000. Right? So it's not an investment. It's just a small amount of money that's not going to change the budget. So let's not kid ourselves that we're doing it. And why weren't we doing it? Because we weren't building the use cases that identified the business problems that the business had, were having, and what the dollar value of those was, or is, and therefore that's why we want this budget. You know, rhetorical question because I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but for example, I wonder if any of you, when looking at EA tooling, has ever gone back, so Max talked about um, onboarding earlier. So I wonder how many of you have calculated if you were ha ramping someone up within a month as opposed to three months, what the cost of two-man months or person months of effort were and how much that's costing the organization. If it's causing people to stay as opposed to leaving, there's a recruitment cost. I wonder how many of you take the time to add up those costs and actually give it back to me in a number. Now, sometimes we don't need to, you know, because sometimes we're dealing with a CFO and we could say, you know, this is going to save 500 person days and they've already done the calculation before we have because they know that there's a monetary value. Less than 20% of EAs recognize improved customer service, cost cutting, or improved margins as a driver for enterprise architecture. Start to understand why the execs don't really understand why we need enterprise architecture. Because if we looked at the top three things at that time on a CEO's wish list, what do you think they might be? It's going to look like an awful lot like the things that we're not interested in as enterprise architects. Hmm, yeah, it starts to become a little challenging. So just some things for you to think about in terms of the way that you rework it. Now, I was asked earlier that given that... Um, I have that Gartner background, and I've also worked for other analysts as well, MWD advisors and such like, to talk around the, some of the methodology there. So I start off by saying, look, we all love a magic wave, okay? Um, can't think who might do such things, but we've got our two axes, you know, great, even greater in the future. I wonder, so you've all looked at waves and quadrants, right? That's an absolute gimme because they're all up there on Google. How many people have actually read in depth the associated report that goes with those graphics? Cool. So quite a few, but still not everyone. Which is kind of amusing because one of the things that I got, and, and the guys won't mind me sharing this, is whether I'm working um, with Linux or whether I'm working with Signavi or any of my other clients, the most common question that I get from them is, why aren't we featured on the Magic Quadrant? And I'll get someone from audience say, why aren't they featured on the Magic Quadrant? I said, I've got a simple question. Have you read it? Have you read the report? Well, no, why? Well, it says here the criteria to be included are X revenue, X number of offices. These are the features that must be in the product. Let me tell you, which of the product does it address all the? No, but we'd still like to, is the usual answer. And the same goes for you guys as users. No, we recognize that, but it would still be easier for us if the product was covered. Well, yeah, it would. But if my aunt was my uncle, etc. cetera. Um, so actually, it doesn't make sense to be there. Now, Andre and I have known each other through conversations going back for most of the life of Linux. 
So, um, you know, coming and working with the guys is, is not new. And we've had those as, I'm not going to say as intellectual debates because I don't believe that they ever were. They were interesting conversations because Linux featured really, really well in inquiry calls. So any of you guys that may have phoned me back in those days, it's quite likely that I'm going to suggest you take a look at it. The conversation will have gone something like, look, if you're just looking at traditional drawing, then it's not really for you. But if you're looking at something that's going to deliver quicker and focus on delivering business value around the number one use case that most people appear to be buying EA tooling for, e.g. application portfolio management rationalization, then it's a, it's a pretty good fit. Pretty good fit, totally different, totally different way of working to everyone else. Recommend you take a look at it. So what would happen is someone would take a look, come back and say, I've had a look at it, it looks really great. But I want to do drawing. Okay, I'll repeat what I said. Do you want to deliver business value or do you want to create drawings? Yeah, I want to do business value, but I want to do drawings. Okay, have you considered doing a different job? <laughs> so, you know, often when you look at any of those quadrants, your favorite tools are never going to be featured. Leading tools are not necessarily the best. Because here's the, the other question I should pose to you. Because some of you will have made purchase decisions based on the Magic Quadrant, and they're a really useful tool. How many of you ever read the Critical Capabilities Assessment? Even less. Do you know, the funny thing is, the Magic Quadrant assesses the vendors. It doesn't assess the products. The Critical Capabilities Assessment is the assessment of the product. So any of you that have been buying based on a leading position in a magic quadrant, thinking the tool's great, and Gartner said it was, they never did. Because in that report that you didn't read, or even if you skimmed over it, it clearly states that the position on the quadrant is the position of the vendor. If you want to see what Gartner thinks of the product, then go read the critical capabilities report. And you will see, um, and if you go back to 2016, let me just use that one off the top of my head, um, Biz Design, who were placed in the leaders segment of the last version of the Quadrant, to the best of my knowledge, weren't a leader in 2016. But they topped almost every category of the Critical Capabilities ass Assessment. And several of the leading products were right down in the middle and the bottom. So please, if you're going to use those things, then look beyond. Now I was talking to Nancy, I can't see where she's hiding on there at the back, Nancy earlier. And um, I'm, I'm going to use Nancy's story because for me, Nancy took the advice that we were giving at places like Gartner and used it in the way it was intended. So if you think about it, we have the quadrant, give you an idea of some vendors you might want to consider. Here's a capabilities assessment. Oh, great, that gives you an idea. But by the way, guys, here's the use cases we had, which is how it came up with it. Your use cases might be different. So what you need to do is to take the principle of the critical capabilities assessment, plug in your use cases, use this as a template for creating your weighting, and then see what shakes out. And you could find that some of those vendors may stay in, and some of them may completely disappear. Because the funny thing is, in the subsequent ones uh, over the last couple of years, it's largely stayed the same, and I'm sure it will change this year, but the basic three use cases were measuring the time to value, making smarter decisions faster, and creating actionable insights. Okay, those are the three use cases we used in 2016. I used in 2017 because I actually wrote the 2017 Magic Quadrant, but because I was leaving, like the week before it was published, it made more sense to stick somebody else's name on it. Um, but all of the assessments and the ratings then I did. And you know, last year's was pretty well the same. Those are interesting use cases because, and this is where the guys at Linux can get frustrated because they know that if we'd taken the Linux approach and mapped it into the critical, forget the quadrant, but just included them in the critical capabilities, and it's the same rules, so you can't get in there, then it would have shaken up the report. Because still today, and I firmly believe this, that products like Linux do a far better job of addressing those three use cases than most of the historical tools, but without the drawing. So the other thing I wanted to just share and, and this is um, going to be a little bit rude. Um, 
But I'm sorry, when I listen to many of you talking, I don't hear many of you doing enterprise architecture. I know it's a tired, boring conversation. We've been having it for more than 20 years. But there is a world of difference between enterprise architecture and IT architecture for the enterprise. Um, you know, this morning um, we had some, some great things and I made some great notes about the talks. But one of the things that I noted, uh, and I think it was in Mike's presentation, so uh, Mike, if it was in yours, then please forgive me. Um, but you looked at the various audiences and you had execs was one of the audiences. And the note that I made to myself is, we need to be more careful in using language. Because if I'm the CEO and the main board of a Fortune 50 company, it's highly unlikely that any of the reports that Linux is producing, however great they are, is going to be a board item agenda. So when we're saying, it's for the execs, is it? Or is it for the IT execs? or for senior management in IT, and a little bit used by you know, some business colleagues. But when we start using the big labels, we just set ourselves up for failure. Because they have a different agenda. And we're using the words a different way. I mean, Max did an absolutely fantastic presentation, but I was smiling because I have that whole issue with the whole agile paradigm, is how to take business words that everyone understands what a PM is, and now let's relabel it. Let's call a PM something different so we can add levels of confusion. Um, we can create product owners, but it's a product owner, not a product owner. Well, what do you mean? I'm Nabisco. I've got a product owner for Shreddies. That's a product. Oh, no, that's not the product that we mean. We mean the product that's the software that's a part of the product. That we... What? We just can't actually create our own vocabulary. In IT, we just seem to have to latch on to a buzzword that someone else likes and then try and re-spin it to be something that's different, suitable for us. So I'm not saying that you guys aren't doing enterprise architecture, but one of the tests that we used to um, perform was, and again, I'm not, I don't want anyone to stick their hands up, I'm gonna protect the innocent, is if business architecture is fundamentally not a part of your team, you're not doing enterprise architecture. Can't be, not possible. You're doing IT architecture. And there's nothing wrong with that. And here's the thing, there's nothing wrong with being an IT architect, right? There's nothing wrong with being an IT planning and assessment and management team, because we need it. The problems are when we say that that's, when we recognize that's what we're doing, but pretend we're up here. What I would say is that many, of, or many if not most, of the successful enterprise architecture groups that we worked with at Gartner and I've worked with over the years, don't even report into IT. They report into the COO, the CFO, the chief strategy officer. They have nothing to do with information systems. Oh, another group, by the way, and this was born out at Forrester recently, report into the CTO, who's an interesting character. And I'm wondering whether actually what we're going to see is CIOs go backwards into being, you know, it's great with this audience, like I said, into going back to being data processing officers, which is what they were before we gave them the big title. Because they're not C-level in most organizations, right? It's a bit like, um, where does the bank manager fit in a bank's hierarchy? It's about here, right? If someone in head office that's a medium level manager is well above the grading of a bank manager these days. But the chief technology officer is crucial and critical. And this talks to some of the stuff that Amy talks about. Forward looking. It's not just about the software, the application. It's about devices. It's about moving things forward. And we need to be going there too. So I was, you know, every, I, I didn't bother completely changing. I like my, Max's idea about completely changing it. So I, I'm going to have to think about completely changing my De Bono quote. Um, gee, that's, sorry, it, it, it looks so clear on here. Um, but Edward De Bono, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have, have done some writing with him in the, in the past. But I love the fact that, gee, we spend all this time analyzing the past, but we have to design the future bearing in mind the lessons of the past. So one of the things that I did, I've changed this around. So by the way, there's a pretty good chance I'm not going to get to the end of my slide deck. And I'm really not that worried, because you guys can read slides ad infinitum. But one of the things that I, I mentioned to um, Ruth and Andre earlier was, you know, we've had some, some great stories. But what other stories can we bring out from customers that might help you? 
So there's a story, some of you, I don't know, did anyone, has anyone seen the video of the talk that I did at Forrester? Good. So this will be new and fresh. Brilliant. So the event was all about digital transformation. And one of the things that became really clear, and this is you know, very impactful from an enterprise architecture perspective, is we don't know the difference between digitization and digitalization and digital transformation. And I picked on this example that I used, which is a customer. Uh, never mind the fact that Andre worked in there, so I've got to be really careful because he knows the inside track, um, whereas I don't, um, is logistics. When did we first start signing for parcels electronically? Uh, keep going. Keep going. It's way back in the early 90s when FedEx first um, did it. Delete that part from the video. Um, so these guys in logistics, um, geomapping, GPS, tracking parcels. That was, hey, we, we were doing this in the 90s. These guys are laughing when they go to a transformation conference and think, you guys are still digitizing what you did 30 years ago? Hey, we, 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 we may move past that. So anyone that doesn't work for Linux and doesn't have an association with Germany, any idea what the picture in the middle is? Okay. It's an electric delivery vehicle. Okay. Um, the, the firm is actually called Street Scooter. And it's pretty significant because in September last year, Street Scooter was the manufacturer of the most selling electric cars in Germany. Okay, 872 registrations. The significance is that Street Scooter is a DHL created company. DHL recognized that you know, everyone was off to build electric cars or buses or whatever, but no one was focusing on electric vans for delivery they saw that actually that was the way of the future. Not just from a cost-cutting perspective, but hey, particularly in, in Europe, where we've got emissions stuff coming in, I can't go deliver. If I'm still running diesel vehicles, I'm not going to be able to deliver. I've got to do something. It's going to disrupt my business. But if you think about it, if you're sitting in the IT department, running on a GPS thing here, how much analysis of the past and drawings of the past are going to help you create a new business for Street Scooter. It's not going to happen. Now, different if it says, right, I've just created this business model for Street Scooter, and um, by the way, as the enterprise architect, we can come back to you, we've had a little look, and obviously we're going to be employing people, so we've had a look, and we could actually just use the payroll application that we were using over here. Um, but we've got a completely different way of taking orders and ordering parts and dealing with suppliers, so we're going to need a new supply chain system. Oh, okay. So we can still borrow from the past, but we've got to build that future. But it doesn't come from the mindset of, oh, well, let's have a look and see what we've got. No, it starts off by saying, what's it going to do? What do we need? Now do we have anything that might help? And I throw these out there because this is the way that, you know, as you know, the businesses and the execs are thinking. They're not down here worrying about those things. Money solves those problems. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the, the electronic signing, um, if you're interested to know how that came about, because there's a real strong lesson there for business versus IT thinking, then we can talk about that over a drink. The third picture um, was fired up because there was a recent IPO in London of a company called Joomja, which is an African e-commerce vendor. Okay? And the, the African press was full of the fact that, wow, an African company is finally being recognized on the world stage for e-commerce. And then the article went on to talk about the analysts looking at the threats to their business. And who do you think the, th the, the, the analysts saw as the threats to Jumja's business? Street vendors. Sorry? The street vendors. Street vendors. So someone said Amazon. Yeah. So I asked this question of the Forrester analysts um, when we were on, when Ruth was on the call. And of course they straight, oh, well, you know, it's going to be Amazon, Alibaba. Straight away we're jumping to those. No, the financial analyst said the biggest threat was DHL. Biggest threat was DHL because they've done um, a deal with about 250 US and UK retailers to provide a common front for them to sell goods into Africa with DHL taking care of all the delivery customs and everything else. Now, who knows where that will really go? 
But let's play that around as an experimentation approach, which is really keen, DHL are really keen on, and think about it. We all talk about Amazon, and that's, oh, we're looking at drone delivery, and we're looking at the, right, so let me get this right. Amazon are looking at delivering things themselves. Hmm, could be a threat to me if I'm in the parcels business, couldn't it? Oh, but hang on a minute, now they've reminded me it's a threat, it's just realized it's an opportunity. Because Amazon would fail dismally if they couldn't actually deliver the packages to the customer, wouldn't they? Ah, yeah. I'm actually the important piece of that jigsaw. What if I took my worldwide overnight delivery capability and worked backwards? I throw these out as A, examples of DHL thinking, but also to suggest to you guys, if you're operating, in my mind, as enterprise architects, these are the kind of things, along with some of the stuff that Amy was looking at around, talking about this morning on the, the tech radar type stuff, that's saying, wow, I, I need to go see the CEO because I've just recognized there's an enormous threat to our business or there's an enormous opportunity. Often now that will be tech enabled or tech threatened. But it's a business conversation first, not a tech conversation. So think about that evolution in your business. What does it mean? How could you elevate your thinking, get yourself elevated up? So that's one example. Uh, and that's one that I shared um, in Chicago. Here's one that I haven't shared yet, so you guys get to see it first, um, which is a, a nearer and easier one to look at, which is Osram. Okay, so they've been going about 110 years. You know, and one of the, some of the conversations that we could have together after the event, we, you don't understand, it's really easy for that young company to be agile, but in our company we've been going a long time and we can't move. Well, that goes back to Max's thing. That's a cultural issue. Let's not use it as an excuse. Osram have been going over 110 years. They've actually created, so having moved from the filament light bulbs through LEDs and moved on. So their hashtag now is that they now see themselves as a digital business. Significant amounts of their revenue and certainly of their profit are coming from, I don't know, things like stage lighting for doing Spice Girls concerts. And you know, they don't have to worry about the quality of the sound because they were doing the light. Um, whether it's the Philips style hue type apps that we're using on our phone. They're recognizing that actually it's about the technology and bringing all those things together. So what they've actually done is they've gone out around all of their business units, taking out all of the parts that are effectively tech businesses and bringing them all together under one banner. Now, I haven't spoken to the Osram execs. I have in my live spoke to a few Philips people who certainly see that there's going to come a point where I'm not interested in the light bulb business. I've got to go beyond it. And in particular, if you think about street lighting, uh, anyone that sells bulbs for street lighting, they're getting out of that business. They're going into the street lighting management business. Why? Because LED bulbs are lasting for 20 times the life, so they can't make the money on the bulbs. They've got to sell the services that main, do a maintaining on it, I'm going to make sure it goes off at dawn, dusk or whatever, and sell added value because they can't make money on the product. So think about your own businesses and think where would those shifts occur and where are you positioned to help your organization make those shifts beyond just, well, if you do that, I can help you with the application or, oh, well, we can have a look at mapping that capability of that application. Sometimes that's relevant, but you can do so much more than that. And you can do so much more of that using Linux. If you just elevate it up and say, well, hey, that's one use case, but I could use it for complete portfolio management. I can, I can look at the, so here's the, the big one that I think you guys are going to have coming up. What about looking at the portfolio of devices? How many devices are you going to have around the edge? How many of you in your um, technology portfolio include all the TVs that are, go, that are in your organization? How many of you recognize the security risks of every one of those connected devices? So I worked with a bank a few years ago in Saudi Arabia who were horrified to realize after we'd had the conversation that every vending machine, everything else was all connected to their main internet. Not just because of the security risk because they weren't controlling the devices, but also they didn't understand that a hacker 
could use the information from vending machines to work out where people were in the building, how many people there were. And if you were of nefarious mind and wish to enter the building where you shouldn't be, then all these devices are telling you where, to, where your people can enter and exit without being discovered. They were horrified because they'd never thought that every camera is on all the time. Never thought about the security and never had it as part of their architecture. Other people have spoken about it, and I just wanted to touch on this, that the Internet of Things kind of overlaps a little bit, but within our world, we talk about application rationalization, data center consolidation, text analysis. These are all interesting things, but that's IT. And I'm going to be a little rude here and say, sometimes I find it really tiring when I say, well, you need bit yep, we've moved to business outcome driven. We are focused on technology standards. That's not a business outcome. I don't see a CEO of many companies, depends on the organization, that's awake at night thinking, my God, how the hell am I going to deliver for the shareholders on technology standardization? I agree, the CIO and the IT group really care about it. It's still an IT outcome. And there's nothing wrong with it. But if we're not getting the budget and we're in the failures, we're in the failures because we thought we were delivering a business outcome. This is the business outcome. Delivering a 5% increase in customer experience, um, bringing new business models to market faster, enabling, enabling mergers and acquisitions on a constant basis. Now, some of you would say it's not relevant to me. I was talking to someone earlier in the pharma space, in pharmaceutical. They seem to always be merging, acquiring, and divesting, right? I've decided I don't want to be an over-the-counter. Well, what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what, we'll give you our agribusiness. And they're swapping these things out left, right, and center. Now, if we wind that back to the space we know, how often do they suddenly go, oh, we didn't realize that we gave away the data that we needed to market for those people because we thought it belonged over there. They don't understand what data they've got where, the application implications, no one's thinking about the fact that we've just doubled our cost because we've halved the number of users, the discount goes out the window. So there are IT associated costs, but these are the business initiatives. These are the things that we need to be talking about. And as if that isn't bad enough, here's a one for you to consider. Some of you would say, we don't really need tooling. You know, we've managed before without tooling because it's not that hard. Well, great, that's today or yesterday. I suggest to you that tomorrow I've been a little conservative with my numbers because you're going to go away from apps to applets, or sorry, applications to apps and applets and microservices, which means we're going to take these monoliths and go back to where we were in the 80s and 70s, having every one of them suddenly becomes 100 applications because it's little pieces. Oh, and we bring the little pieces together in different ways to construct new app master applications on the fly. Wow, it's great because we can, and we've got a DevOps team and an Agile team, and they can do it without even thinking. Who needs documentation anyway? Yeah, we're Agile. We don't need none of that structure. <coughs> I'm sorry, Agile at the enterprise level needs structure. But then we've got all those technologies, I say with devices, it's all ramping up and up and up. So Andre mentioned earlier, and I'm going to flick through these because I'm conscious of time. Um, so after the event for the survey, so you guys are all going to get this. Um, so I produced a little report with the questions and the insights that we got and some suggestions. So um, the guys are going to email that to you. So I don't need to spend lots of time on this. You're going to get that to read at your leisure. But isn't it scary to think, oh, by the way, just to say, so Andre mentioned the survey sample was fairly small, 130 people, largely all through my personal LinkedIn network. Some of you may have seen me posting in a couple of the, the things there. The purpose was really simple. At the time, some of you may know that there was nothing out there of my association with these guys. Well, we kind of agreed that we were going to work together, but I was also interested and said, well, I know what I think about what these guys are doing. Let me ask a few questions and see what other people think and what the opportunity is without being you know, really obvious. So, you know, hence the reason, well, is anyone looking at changing tooling? Because for, for Linux, that's a, a market opportunity. But, you know, this was the one that's really scary. We just said 20 years. How the hell in 20 years can 30% of enterprise architects still suggest that they can't use a tool or don't use a tool or won't use it or some other excuse? It doesn't stack up. You know, and 
Max was talking a bit about change. Some of you were asking about change. And this touches a little bit more on the BPM side that I cover. And, and I always say that, you know what's so funny when I'm talking to process management people about change? They're the people that are most resistant. So they're the most resistant, and the same goes with enterprise architects and tools. And I have the same thing to pose to you guys as I pose to the process team. And I say, okay, so you want other people to change, but you won't change yourself. Credibility problem. You want other people to use the tools that you want them to use, but you won't use a tool. Well, you know, there's a bit of a credibility gap there. Um, I'm not going to believe someone that's not actually fundamentally valuing anything that I should listen to them. So that was one. Um, the other piece was that Andre shared was about the actionable insights. And again, I don't want, I'm going to let you read those. This is the slide I wanted to particularly mention. Um, I don't know whether this is going to help you. But I shared this. I mean, I've, this was something I produced some time ago called the Wheel of Change. I shared it with a couple of people at a power user day in Bonn. And for some reason, the users that were there were rushing away, scribbling it down, wanting immediate copies that I hadn't even prepared. So what I want you to imagine for a moment is that each of these rings rotates. So they're in, each independent. And at each intersection as they rotate, it generates a question. So, you know, um, who's responsible for the process that generates revenue from customers? Okay. Um, how does the organization reduce waste to satisfy stakeholders, for example? So if you just assumed that at each, inter each of those, there was one question, that's 1,296 questions. That's assuming there's one, not that there's two, three. One. How do you answer those? without a tool like this? How? Never mind, and also I would say, how do you even think that you're gonna diagram something to answer every one of those questions? It's not there. You know, that slide I showed with all the time, you haven't got time to do that. So um, I think the cotter curve that uh, Max used is great. I would love to see and maybe we should do one, Max, of a spoof version where we literally change everything that Cotter said from years into months because that's kind of where we're getting to for the reality, right? We haven't got time to draw it anymore. It's about the interface and the connectivity. So I, this is a great way of demonstrating value to management. I've used it with executives all over the world for many, many years. And I just say, look, I understand you haven't got the budget. I understand you don't want to do these things. But just tell me, how do we currently answer these questions, and how are we going to answer them in the future? And by the way, not being able to do them now has not been an issue, but when you look at regulation and competitive threat, not being able to do them in the future is likely to wind us in jail. Quite simple. In the deck you're going to get, I've shared some of the other use cases, and this is the scary part, so I've got some stuff here from Forrester, some stuff out of Gartner, and again, what we see is enterprise architects still focus on the IT use cases. These surveys say, management says, hey, I need to improve customer experience. You know, I need to support digital business trans. They don't say greatly um, quality delivery, 18%. Um, yeah, okay, there's a, there's a consolidation, but again, that tends to be... So the IT, right, oh, yeah, this is really, really important. The business doesn't see it that way. Now, sometimes they should. And to some of the stuff that Amy was talking about, if they don't see it, it's our fault, not theirs, because we didn't express it in a business problem. SAP's going out of, you know, thing, you know, well, that's, it's going to cost us 20% more for support because we're using the old release. Yeah, I can live with that. Which means that you've got an increased chance of going to jail. Right, how much do we need to spend when? We're just not giving it back to them in a way that they understand. So, I want to jump on two ones I want. So this was the one that was also really scary. What percentage of people who could or should use the data in your EA tools do? 67% of people suggest that less than 20% of those that could, should, or would are using. Now, I, I don't mind saying, and Andre won't mind my joking about this, um, I wanted to change his slide this morning. 
So the guys are doing a great job at growing. But I, I kind of said, to, yeah, this 180 customers, it's kind of boring. Because those 20-year-old companies, they're saying they've got 1,000 customers. It's bullshit, by the way, because they're not active customers. They have sold to 1,000 organizations over 20 years, but they're not using it today. But nonetheless, they're going to put 1,000 against 180. So I say to everyone in Linux, and, and for you guys to take home when you're thinking, well, should I evaluate this product or not? And here's the one that wows me. 90,000 users. Show me which other vendor has ever come close to 90,000 users of the information that's held, created, and maintained in their enterprise architecture product. For you guys talking to other users, I would recommend you want to be going interacting and say, well, gee, how does these people have four or 5,000 users? Who am I missing? How did they get all of the project managers involved? How did they, following Max, get all the agile teams? How did they get everyone that was doing those things involved? Wow, what do I need to do? Because if you are, even if you're a customer, I'm going to say this, if you don't have hundreds, you ain't getting the best value out of this tool. And as Mike pointed out this morning, it doesn't cost you anymore. It's not as though, and this is the thing, it's not going to cost you. Never before have you had the opportunity to provide that level of functionality for free. And what's the worst thing about it? The worst thing about it is they keep coming back to me and say, this is really useful. Can you put more information in? Can you maintain this information? Gee, when did anyone ever ask to maintain enterprise architecture information? It just doesn't happen. And when you're talking to people, look at those different views. Okay, these are primarily IT views, but leveraging and using those. This was a, a, a nice one, and I thank Andre for this, because I thought he was going to use this slide this morning and didn't, so I plugged it in this afternoon, um, which is, uh, as, uh, he did a lot of work in making this slide look pretty. And it's really nice in terms of saying, hey, when we look at the, the ranking of how important people perceived various pieces of the jigsaw when looking at tools, and you know, the list was provided by me, uh, is this really important, not important, etc. Wow, all of the things that they see as being really important that's the stuff these guys do really, really well. As Andre said, democratizing EA. And by the way, I think that must be a German thing. I don't know whether it's because, you know, after the wall and bringing together the East and West, you know, I see it with Signavio. I see it with, uh, with here with Linux. We hear Salonis in process mining talking about it. German firms seem, seem to be really keen on the idea of democratizing whatever it is they touch. Um, it's just a shame that SAP didn't democratize ERP, but um, we might be in a different world. So the democratization must be, must be this German thing, but hey, we can learn and we can benefit from that. Christian was talking earlier, hey, you know, the ecosystem stuff is really, really important. It's not an island. And then whether we think about it as actionable insights or accelerating decisions, that's really, really important. One other stat, and I didn't have it up there, you'll see it in the report, which kind of scared me. I also asked people about the time to value and how important a short time to value was. I couldn't believe the number of people who said, ah, it's not really important. You know, it's okay if it takes 12 months. Like, really? Because, you know, when I talk to your bosses, they love the idea that they can start to get value after three months. Now, if you engage, and this will be a recommendation I have for any of you that aren't yet engaged with Linux, is that you can go through and you could do things, quote, properly, this is your discipline, not the tool, and deliver value in six to nine months easily. However, you can do things that are quick and dirty and deliver in less than 90 days that prove the value of what you're doing that justify more easily the money to go forward. I recommend that quick and dirty, showing that it's solving a problem in a way that we've not solved it before and quickly is a better approach. I'm sorry. The, uh, well, it's got to be nuanced and right. That's that architecture thing. We've just got to get out of that world. And the last thing for those of you looking at quadrants and the such like is that um, go and look at Gartner Peer Insights as another leveler. Or if you're a fan of the product and what these guys do, and you're struggling to get others to buy into it, point them at Peer Insights and let them look at what legacy reviews are out there versus the newer reviews. Okay, there's a difference in numbers and, you know, um, hey, it's on the video here, so that's great. So all the Linux people in the room, you know, I'll be constantly beating up. They know I've already started. They said, why aren't you getting more of you to be leaving Peer Insights reviews? So if you're a customer and you haven't let, yet left one on there for them, then please do them a favor. 
go and put one up there. They're anonymous. So even those of you that say, well, our company doesn't like to be associated publicly, it's not a problem. Go out and validate them all. They're all genuine end users. There's a lot of rigor that goes into it. But from your point of view, they can be anonymous. So that was a fast track through what I had, a whole bunch of stuff, which is completely different from what I planned on delivering in the original slot this morning. Um, but I wanted to deliver something that was a little different rather than mimicking what you've already heard through the other sessions today. I hope it's helped. I look forward to continuing the engagement. I wish you all every success in going forward. You're dealing with a great company, and I can say that because although they pay me a little bit of money, they don't pay me enough to say that. Um, <laughs> Well, there was a joke, at, there's a joke, and, and I know we're on video, but it was no, no comparison that, you know, at Gartner we have to be very careful, and one of my, my old boss, he said, Look, I haven't met a vendor yet that could pay you enough money to actually persuade you to be anything other than the, in, from an integrity point of view. So, uh, however much they pay, it's not enough for me to come and lie. <laughs> so, they do a great job at what they do, but, you know, it's not a drawing tool. If you still want to be doing that, then good luck. Ladies and gentlemen, good luck, and thank you very much indeed. <laughs>